the quote for today, so long as we do not consent to sin, there is no power, whether human or satanic, that can bring a stain upon the soul. A man whose heart is stayed upon God is just the same in the hour of his most afflicting trials and most discouraging surroundings as when he was in prosperity and the light and favor of God seemed to be upon him. Let us stand as we see in the doxology. <clears throat> Psalm 66, verses 1 through 4 says, Make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands. Set forth the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say unto God, How terrible art thou in thy works. Though through the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee, all the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee, and they shall sing to thy name. Uh, it was a very interesting week this last week, um, but I will say I, I, I did have an interview um, with that other position that I told y'all about, and uh, I ended up getting the job. Uh, my last day on the floor I'm on now will be the 25th. Uh, then I'll uh, begin this new job of uh, putting in pacemakers, putting in defibrillators, and doing these studies of the heart. Uh, pray for me, I'll have to learn a lot of new information quickly. Uh, I have to learn a, a lot of the different little ways of these different cardiologists. Uh, and Lord willing, I'll. Uh, be able to uh, be very good, thorough, and safe as I help people uh, fix different problems with their heart. At this time, if you got a testimony, you could just speak up. And tell us. Yes, ma'am. Well, I praise God for uh, the way He protected us with the heat this week and with the trips that we took to town and and doctor's appointments and. I praise him for our daughter's life, that she's having a birthday today, 53 years of life, and she's been a diabetic since she's about 17, so, or 18, and so she's had a lot of challenges, and we praise God that he's seen her through them. Mm -hmm. I 
to mention one other thing I forgot. A few weeks ago, I mentioned there was a young man that doesn't want anybody talking to him about God, and he says he doesn't believe in God and everything. And uh, I don't. Re and I have. I was asking y'all to pray for him that he would soften up toward his Creator. And it was very interesting. About two weeks later, I had the report that. He was going through a hard time, and a friend had, in fact, he was almost suicidal, I guess. A friend had sent him that uh, poem that's out here in our lobby about uh, how Jesus carried us, carries us, you know, when we can. You'll have to read it when you get out in the lobby. And somehow that impressed him so much that he started wanting just a little bit more interest in, in God. So... Prayers do change things and keep praying for each other and for those that we meet that that pretend like they are off limits to God, but pray for them because the Holy Spirit can go where we can't go. He said that something about that poem just overwhelmed me. So Interesting. that to me was, you know, a miracle. Absolutely. I want to praise God that my little brother's here today. Amen. Uh, in Florida. And uh, uh, he's wanting to get baptized, but uh, our baptism was not ready yet. And uh, so I'm thinking about taking him out to the lake and dunking him in. Sir, <laughs> 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 hold his bricks. <laughs> praise God. <laughs> he can join Pat if you, if you stick around a little while. Amen. Amen. Um, Charles is going to lead out of the hymn of praise near the cross on page 312. Please stand. <laughs> Thank you. 
The scripture reading is Luke chapter 1, verse 13 through 17. Luke chapter 1, verses 13 through 17. And it says, But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John, and thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in spirit and power of Elias, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. At this time, we'll kneel and bring our concerns before God. Father in heaven, Lord, you promised in your word that where the two or three are gathered, Jesus will be in the midst. And where Jesus is, you are. Where you are, the Holy Spirit is. We thank you. We embrace your presence. It's hot outside. Nevertheless, we made it here today. And we thank you for that. There's something that we needed to hear and experience this day, and you made sure that nothing would stop. A small remnant that made it here today, therefore let us receive that blessing, Lord, with gladness. Thank you for your tender mercies. This world is wicked, it is cold, and tomorrow it'll be even more wicked and even more cold. So we need that hedge of protection. Let us be mindful that when we walk into a room, our army of angels walk in that room with us. We mean everything to you, Father. We are the apple of your eye. We thank you for the privilege to be able to call you Father. We should be able to be labeled as the sons and daughters of the one true living God. Lord, we ask that you to protect us from the evilness that is entwined with this coronavirus. Everything about it, Lord, protect us. We need not walk around here in fear. We need not walk around here dismayed. We have not been given a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. For even though these are dangerous times, the gospel must go forth. And the virus of sin is still most deadly. It has eternal effects. The only cure for it is the gospel. Father God, continue to lead us in the way that we should go. In these times, we dare not trust ourselves, trust our own wisdom. We need more than just the leading of the Holy Spirit. We need the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, Lord. Fill us. Allow us to gain spiritual knowledge today 
that we may use and apply today and tomorrow. Furthermore, because Jesus lives, we can face today. Father God, we are Christians. Please make that statement true as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. and the offerings today are going to help out the women's ministry when the deacons come forward. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we offer these offerings with a cheerful heart with a given heart. Do as you please. In Jesus' name, amen. The other day I downloaded a little story off of the web entitled Angels All Around. I was really impressed by this story. It's found on a website called Revival and Reformation.org. I want to read this short story because it has a bearing on what we're going to study today from God's Word. I must share an amazing experience that just happened recently. <clears throat> this is Melanie Coleman wrote this. My husband is a pastor in the U.S. state of Oregon, and it was opening night of our evangelistic series, Revelation of Hope. I've been encouraged, encouraging more prayer in our church, so I decided that I would oversee the prayer room during the series. My team consisted mostly homebound 
elderly friends or people praying from their homes, so I wasn't sure how much participation I would have during the meetings. I decided to create a prayer room anyway, hoping that some church members would be willing to come in and pray periodically during the meetings. That first Friday night, it was just me. I felt alone. But I prayed anyway. Again, Sabbath evening, it was just me. I felt a bit more discouraged. I put on a beautiful rendition of the Lord's Prayer. While it played, I prayed. I know that where two or three are gathered together in your name, you are there, Lord. But what if it's just me? I prayed silently. When the song finished, I opened my eyes and the room was full of angels. I started crying as I looked around the room in amazement. The angels were tall, as tall as the ceiling, with broad shoulders. They stood shoulder to shoulder with their backs to the wall around the edges of the room. I felt tiny compared to them. They had wings and wore flowing robes like clothes. I was drawn to their faces. They looked like men, very handsome men. Their eyes were so kind and they smiled gentle, comforting smiles. Their, their facial features were defined and they had a warrior-like atmosphere of boldness about them. Their dark hair flowed down their shoulders and they looked almost iridescent. While I couldn't see through them, I almost could. Their forms shone with a yellow-white color. I was only able to see them for four or five seconds and then they were gone. But I couldn't stop crying. For the rest of the evening, I had been so discouraged and wondering if God could work if it was only me in the prayer room. He showed me in a miraculous way that if one person is praying, it is enough. I feel so unworthy and humble that he would give me this great gift. I still cry often as I think about its sacred experience. I continue to pray in our church prayer room alone. But I am no longer discouraged, for I know the room is full of angels. Even though I can't see them, I just had to share. We must never underestimate the power of prayer. Even if it's just one person is praying, that's enough. God is at work, even when we can't see. This was posted in February of this year. Remember that on resurrection morning, when the ladies came to the tomb, they said they saw angels. And every gospel writer that records that incident records the fact that the ladies saw angels. I don't doubt this experience. I believe that when we get to the kingdom 
and we're able to talk to the angels, we will find a story that will amaze us as to how much they have been involved in our lives here for Jesus. How they want to help us. There's a story in the Bible of an angel. He came to church one day. We've heard the story. But I invite you to open your Bibles to Luke, the first check. Though we will look at a few other verses, we will be mostly in Luke, the first chapter. So if you will open your Bibles to it, I'm reading from the New American Standard Version, but it's very close to the New King James Version. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abba, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Now let's continue on with verse 8. Now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. If you were a member of the family of Aaron, a descendant of Aaron, and a male, you were automatically a priest. It was estimated that at this time there were in excess of 20,000 men that qualified as priests. And so what they did is twice a year you had your turn to go to the temple one week out of uh, at a time. And so twice a year your turn came up. But there were so many that when they got to the temple to do their week's tour of duty and it was a highlight of the year, for them, though these priests, this is what they lived for, there were too many to do all of the chores. So they used lots to choose who was to do the morning sacrifice, who was to do the evening, who was to take care of the altar of incense, and so on. And Zechariah received the lot for this particular service to uh, present the incense before the Lord. Verse 10, And the whole multitude of the peoples were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. So Zechariah is in the holy place. A highlight of the year for him to do his duty as a priest. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. And Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel, and fear gripped him. Now Zacharias, when he saw the angel, didn't pay much attention to the fact that he was on the right side of the altar, which was the good side, because he was fearful Fear gripped him. If I was in his shoes, I'd have probably been just as much, if not more so, afraid as he was. When I saw this big angel standing there in front of me. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias. Your petition has been heard. What petition? 
Tisch. At their age, it said they were getting old, it most likely was not for a baby. When you get old, you don't ask for another baby. That's just not normal. So, what would they have been praying for? They were praying for the Messiah. Your prayer has been answered. But then Gabriel goes on. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. What has that got to do with the Messiah? It has a whole lot to do with the Messiah. That's what we're going to find out. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, while yet in his mother's womb. I'm going to have another sermon on this same as we, part two of this subject. And we will, we will unpack that a lot deeper, a lot more in the next sermon. But here we have John, the baby, who will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. Never underestimate what the Lord can do with a baby. And he will start while it's in the womb. Luke chapter 1, now let's go to verse 16. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. Here is the reason John's going to be there. Zechariah, this is the reason for your son. This is why your prayers have been answered. He will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him, that's the Messiah, in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This last phrase. So as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord is the topic of today's message. We're going to unpack that one much more. This last part is a description of what John's mission will be. But it's also a part of our mission today to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. The angel gave John's father the why for John. Oh, Zachariah jumped to the how. You know, we, if we don't understand the why, we'll never know how. But we need, we need to understand why we are here. Why we have been put on this planet. There is a reason. And God's given us that reason. But Zechariah said to the angel, verse 18, How will I know this is for certain? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. Now, gentlemen, that's the way you speak about your wife's age. You may call yourself an old man, but don't call her an old woman. You say she's advanced in years. He was being very diplomatic here. How old was Zachariah? You know, it's interesting, the Bible doesn't tell us. And yet it does. We know for a fact that he's no older than 49 years old. Now, how do we know that? 
because it was part of the, the layout and the rules and the regulations of the priesthood that when you turned 50, you were retired. Left it up for some younger to take your place. So Zechariah was still a priest. He hadn't turned 50. Now, I don't know about you, but I look at 50 year olds and I think you all are young. You know? So, but he's looking, he's an old man. He's going to be retired here pretty quick if he's 49. And he evidently was pretty close to that. Because he'll be 50 pretty soon when we don't know what his birthday was. But Gabriel gave Zechariah a long time out. Have you ever given your children a time out? Time out. Sit still in that chair and don't say a word. And a minute seems like eternity and two minutes is a couple of eternities. And we have a hard time holding that much longer than that. But Zechariah received a time out of nine months. I believe the longest time out in the Bible was Nebuchadnezzar. He got seven years time out when he was eating grass because he was so proud. The Lord gave him an opportunity to rethink that. But that's in the book of Daniel, but we're, we're here in Luke, the first chapter. The angel said, answered and said to him, I, do you know who I am? He said, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place. Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. Angel Gabriel. The Prime Minister of the Universe. You see, a Prime Minister is just under the king. Gabriel's one of the covering angels. He replaced Lucifer. Thank God we have Gabriel on our side. They helped counter Lucifer. You're going to be silent. We will learn next time also as we read to the, the story of, of when John was born, Zacharias was probably not only could he not speak, he was dumb, but he probably couldn't hear either. He was deaf and dumb. Silence for nine months. As we look at the details uh, as we get further into the chapter, I'm going to give you nine months to think about. Now that Gabriel says, you're going to think and realize, don't question when God brings you good news. Let's continue on with verse 21. The people were waiting for Zacharias and were wondering at his delay in the temple. But when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. They realized that he had seen the vision in the temple and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. When the days of his priestly service were ended, he went back home. After these days, Elizabeth's wife became pregnant. And she kept herself in seclusion for five months saying, this is the way the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked with favor upon me to take away my disgrace among men. It was a big thing for a lady to have children in those days. Remember that phrase that Gabriel told Zacharias, that John's mission was to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This is the mission 
of us today. We are born on the edge of eternity. And Gabriel has quoted from Malachi 4. To find Malachi, let's go to the verse, the first part of Matthew. Back up one more page and you'll be in the, the last page of the Old Testament. Malachi 4. We're going to set the context because the uh, Gabriel's quoting from Malachi 4. But let's set the context of what he's talking about. So we'll start with verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and evil doer will be checked. For the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts. So that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. He will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. He will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. Malachi is clear talking about the second coming of Jesus. Gabriel quotes now, beginning with verse 5. So we know that the context here in Malachi is the second coming prophecy of Jesus. When Gabriel says, when he's quoting, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great, terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. John's mission to prepare a people for the Lord. Our mission to prepare a people for the Lord. And Gabriel corroborates that this message is not only for John, John's day. This message is for our day. As he is quoted from a passage in Malachi that is prophesying the second coming. We are to be preparing a people to meet the Lord. We are to prepare a people for the coming of the Lord. This is our mission and purpose. And we, every one of us here, us old folks and you younger ones are all born on the edge of eternity. And we have a purpose. God has a purpose for us. That purpose is to prepare, just like John's purpose. God has chosen us to do this. We have been born in these last days. We understand that our why, and when we understand our why, our why is to prepare a people to meet the Lord. And Jesus told us in Matthew 24, 14, this gospel of the kingdom, this good news of Jesus Christ will go to all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then what happens? The end will come. And this is where we're living. In the end. And as we studied the last several sermons that I've had, it's all been about end time events, end time things. What are we doing about it? Are we spreading the word? Gabriel's message was not only for the first coming, but for the second coming. God chose John before he was born. The pre incarnate Christ. Before he was born as a babe in Bethlehem, he went and he pointed, I want that baby. That's my forerunner. He's going to announce my coming. He picked John out. He's picked you out with a job, with a chore, with an opportunity. He knows what it is, and if you if you will yield your life to Him, He will let you know what it is. You have a purpose. 
God has chosen. He's chosen you before you were born. He chose old Saul. But he didn't realize his message. He didn't realize his why, why he was born until on the road to Damascus when he fell off his horse in the white light and Jesus said, why did you persecute me? And he was converted. What we do with this moment in the history of salvation is important. We are to prepare a people to meet the Lord. I want to give you a warning. This is a dangerous mission. Gabriel has a counterforce. It's called Satan. It used to be Lucifer. And he'll oppose you at every step. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who died in a German concentration camp, made the statement that when Jesus calls, when Christ calls you, he calls you to die. He died not long after he made that speech. As we look past down into history, we find over and over God's spokesman gave up their all. And Jesus, when he came, was no different. He came to die for us. He wants us to take up our cross and follow him. Now I want to go to Luke 3. Let's look at John as he begins his ministry. Luke 3, it's only just a couple of chapters over. Starting with verse 1 now in the 15th year, and I remember that Luke not only was a physician, he was a historian, so he throws in the first few verses, a bunch of historical things so we know what time it was in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod we know who he was, the Tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip was Tetrarch of the region of Peturia and Tetranitis and Lysinus was Tetrarch of Abilene in the high priesthood of Ananias and Caiaphas, sorry, we know who they are. The word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias. In the wilderness, in the wilderness. And he came into all the district around Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the Words of Isaiah the prophet. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Remember, we have the why for John. To make people ready to meet the Lord. But what's the how? It's found right in front of us. A voice. You have a voice. We have a voice. Now, say I can't speak. You may not be able to spend time in front of thousands of people speaking. But you can have sometimes, some of you, I wish there was more of our younger group here, because that's this fits you and those that are not here so well, you can have an electronic voice. I enjoy listening to this story in one of the things I was watching on, on the internet. It's a story of that car from Georgia. Not Georgia of the United States, but Georgia over in, in the far, far east. Below Russia and north of Iran is a country called Georgia. 
And this young man came to the United States to go to school. He was in one of our colleges. Mary Springs, Michigan. He spoke Georgian as well as English. Georgian is one of the ten oldest languages in this world. Not a whole lot of people still know that language, but there are at least four or five million of them that left Georgia, and some of them are in New York City, some in Los Angeles, some in Paris, some in the United Kingdom, out of different places of the world, but they can speak Georgian. And that car decided that he was going to do a little website and communicate in Georgian to those of his countrymen around the world about the message of God's coming soon, preparing a people to meet God. So he started getting things together and he realized there's no literature in Jordan. We have the book Steps to Christ and that's about it. This little book, it's a good book. But there's no literature about a message in, in Georgia. So he collected some, some Bible studies and he began to translate them and he put them on, on the web, on his website. Then he got himself a table, a smartphone, a lamp, and a laptop. And he began to, to record himself from his translation into Georgian, the gospel message. In six months, he had 94,000 viewers following his post. Find a need and fill it. Find a need and fill it. There's another story I watched and enjoyed. It's about a fellow by the name of Adamir. Adamir spoke Portuguese. He was born in Brazil. He came to the United States to go to school. He studied to be a landscaping uh, specialist. But he decided he needed to, to do something for the Lord. So it was last September, 19, 2019, September. He said, I'm going to have this website. And Lord, I have a goal. By the end of the year, I want 100,000 people watching it. Well, every January, well, before that, December 25, December 25, the day after Christmas, he decided to check and see how many people were following him on his Portuguese little website as he would sit in front of the camera a little lamp the laptop and he would record and post his message and he wanted to be a member's goal remember what his goal was a hundred thousand he checked and there was a little over three hundred thousand from September to December 26. God is blessing. Now, Adam here doesn't talk. He doesn't speak. He quotes other people. He quotes from other books. He's putting up these quotations. He's reading these quotations. He's not 
He's not trying to design his own message. But he had 300,000 plus from September to December 26. Every January, they had a big family reunion in Brazil. And so he went to Brazil for the family reunion. And when he got back, he checked the website again. And, and he's reaching now uh, 1 million point eight people. It had grown. Then he gets a phone call from a person in Mozambique. Are you the one that's running this website? Remember, it's dealing in Portuguese. They speak Portuguese in Mozambique. He said, yes. He said, what church are you? He said, well, isn't it very obvious? He said, well, evidently not to me. So he said, Seventh day Adventist. Well, it was only another week and he got another call. This time the call came from Mobutu, city of Mozambique. And they said, we would, we're going to have an evangelistic series here and we would love for you to announce it and put the dates and the times on your website. Remember, this is Mobutu in Mozambique, in Africa, on your United States website. So he does. He plugs their evangelism the church. What happens? By the time we get past April, he's got 4.8 million and 458 baptisms. Can you praise God? What he can do even though he couldn't, he didn't speak. He used other people's stuff. You see, we have a voice. You may not be involved in the internet. You may not be involved in the stuff of the uh, what goes on uh, today in all of these websites, but you can speak to somebody, to a neighbor. To a friend, tell them the God who's coming soon loves you and wants you. He wants you to be ready when he comes. Once you know why God has placed you in this time frame, on the edge of eternity, God will guide you into what you are to be doing. You see, well, I just can't speak. There was someone in the past that had that excuse. You'll find him in Exodus, the fourth chapter. We'll begin with verse 10. Exodus 4, verse 10. Then Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord, I've never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, nor since you've spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. And God responds. The Lord responds, maybe not as happily as he would like to respond, but he responds. The Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seen or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then go, and I, even I, will be your mouth and teach you what to say. There was a young prophet that told the Lord, I don't know how to speak. I'm too young. You'll find it in Jeremiah 
the first chapter beginning with the sixth verse. Alas, Lord, God, behold, I do not know how to speak because I am a youth. But the Lord said to him, Do not say I am a youth, because everywhere I send you, you shall go. And all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Gabriel gave us our task. He gave us why we are here. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. We have a voice, whether it's electronic, whether it's written. Esther was mentioning someone, how the poetry was reaching them, and she has a, her poems now online, available. I pray that the Lord will lead people to them because they will lead you to Christ if you read them. You may use social media. You may just use your voice. Your actions. In the community. With the people you know. But God wants us to use our voice in whatever way He wants that we can do it. But we have a chore. We have a task. We have something God will lead us into doing. And that is how to spread the message to prepare a people ready for the Lord. The Lord is coming soon. We've been looking at how soon that can be. It can be very quickly. Things are set in place. We are to be ready to give God's message to prepare a people to meet the Lord, our loving Father. As we look at the times in which we live and we realize we're right on the edge of eternity and your coming is soon, Lord, I pray that you will burn into our hearts the desire to find some way to tell someone else, to prepare people to be ready to meet God. That we ourselves may be prepared in the process as we tell others, so that when Jesus comes, we can joyfully say with all the others, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for Him, and He will save us. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for viewing our videos. Hope this was for you and yours. Um, hopefully, please to like and subscribe to our videos and everything we have, every platform we have. Thank you. God bless.